the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds, your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadows of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. O continue your steadfast love to those who know you, and your salvation to the upright of heart. Dear friends, sisters and brothers, the words of Psalm 36 accept as a greeting from Lockerbie, Drivesdale, Hutton and Cory Church of Scotland. And let us enjoy the feast of abundance and the shadow of protection which we find in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us praise him with upright hearts. We'll sing the hymn called Still. You can find it in Mission Praise Hymn Book number 1057.
Thank you all for coming again to this virtual online church fellowship based in Lockerbie, Scotland, but spreading to many other corners of our world. I hope Lord Jesus will bless us with his presence and with his word again. Big thanks to all who took part in this online video worship, Katka for playing piano and organ, Shimon for programming drums, Lydia and Anna for singing, and big thanks to Mr. Gary Shanks for a bunch of fresh photos, again the wildlife of Lockerbie. I want to remind you of the challenges from the last week. First, if you have anything you want to share with others within the frame of these online services, pictures, videos, texts, prayers or prayer topics, don't hesitate and send them to me. And if you have a favorite hymn or song which you would like to sing together, let me know and we'll try to record it for some of the next videos. We have good news about little Tanya, the child with leukemia uh, for whom we have been praying. She had some doses of chemotherapy and a bone marrow test last week, quite unpleasant procedures, but she copes with it very well. Uh, the infections she has been struggling with are also almost gone. So the doctors were able to reduce the dose of antibi antibiotics she had to get. She is still very weak, but eating all right with great appetite and playing and sometimes even singing, which is great, great leap from where she was three weeks ago. And it's a great miracle. So let us thank God for it. She still has a very long way to, to, to go to recovery, but the start she made is promising. So please keep, keep on praying and don't forget to thank the Lord for keeping Tanya and her family and all of us in his care. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love and care. Thank you that you are with us always. Thank you now especially for little Tanya. Thank you for the improvements she made. Thank you that her body accepted the treatment well. Thank you for the doctors, nurses and all carers. Thank you for their skill, their knowledge and experience. And Lord, we ask you humbly to continue in Tanya's healing. Comfort her parents with your love and peace. Give them faith in you as a weapon against all fear and anxiety. And Lord Jesus, we all bring to you our fears and anxieties. We lay down both our successes and failures under your cross. Lord, support what is good in our lives and help us to put right what is wrong. We confess our sin before you and pray for forgiveness. And we pray that you speak to us your word, word of salvation. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we rejoice in you and praise you with every word, thought or deed. Amen. Let us hear the readings. First from the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, and then chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. 
the story of Adam and Eve. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. But now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God has made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, No, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one of wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed figs, fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, uh, the, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I, I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. This was the reading from the book of Genesis. The second reading comes from the first Kings, chapter 3, verses 3 to 28. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statues of, statutes of his father David. Only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I should give you. 
Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and in uprightness of heart towards you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourselves, for yourself long life or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. If you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. Then Solomon awoke. It had been a dream. He came to Jerusalem, where he stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. He offered up burnt offerings and offerings of well-being, and provided a feast for all his servants. And later, two women who were prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. One woman said, Please, my lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and I gave birth while she was in the house. Then on the third day, after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth. We were together. There was no one else with us in the house only the two of us were in the house. Then this woman's son died in the night, because she lay on him. She got up in the middle of the night and took my son from beside me while your servant slept. She laid him at her breast and laid her dead son at my breast. When I rose in the morning to nurse my son, I saw that he was dead, but when I looked at him closely in the morning, clearly it was not the son I had born. But the other woman said, No, the living son is mine, and the dead son is yours. The first said, No, the dead son is yours, and the living son is mine. So they argued before the king. Then the king said, One says, This is my son that is alive, and your son is dead. While the other says, Not so, your son is dead, and my son is the living one. So the king said, Bring me a sword. 
and they brought a sword before the king. The king said, Divide the living boy in two, then give half to one and half to the other. But the woman whose son was alive said to the king, because compassion for her son burned within her, Please, my lord, give her the living boy, certainly do not kill him. But the other said, It shall be neither mine nor yours, divide it. And then the king responded, Give the first woman the living boy, do not kill him, she is his mother. All Israel heard of the judgment that the king had rendered, and they stood in awe of the king, because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to execute justice. This was the reading from the first book of Kings. And now we can, we can sing the hymn, Make Me a Captive Lord, number 534. Critics sometimes, when arguing against Christians and Jews, of course, because we are on the common field of the Old Testament, the critics sometimes say that God wants his people without thinking, without opinion, just blindly carrying out orders. And they point out 
to the very well-known text from Genesis, the text about the first sin. And they understand it that a sin means independent thinking, personal view of matters. They say, God forbade Adam and Eve to eat the fruit, which could open their eyes and give them ability to know good and evil. Like God would like to keep that knowledge just for himself. Well, unfortunately, even some Christian leaders sometimes support this point of view when wanting people to just to copy an universal worldview and follow blindly their leading. But I believe this is beyond the border of Christian faith. And it's more a sign of a sect. The Bible definitely doesn't say we should switch off our brains or abandon common sense. There is uh, one hymn, in a Czech hymn, which I really love. Uh, it's old one, very old, written by very clever and one of the most educated men of his time in Europe, uh, Jan Amos Comenius. And it says well, very nice, nice words. Lord, if you have given us the gift of, of the reason and the common sense, help us with your mercy. Help us to use it for the glory of your name. I think this is a real Christian attitude. We can look at the story of King Solomon. The Bible says he was the wisest person in the world. And his wisdom the ability to judge between good and evil came as a gift of God. And it's exactly what the critics say the Bible does not like. Independent thinking on responsibility for decision making. Solomon asked from God, Exactly that what Adam in paradise wanted to get by theft. And what caused not his being better and wiser, but what drove him out of God's garden of peace. So that Solomon asked for wisdom to discern between good and evil. And he got it from God. And his wisdom was proved the same day when he was able to solve an extremely intricate problem of the two ladies brawling over one child alive and one dead. We all know the situation and we all appreciate the difficulty of solving the riddle with no evidence and no witnesses. And we all admire the simple perfection of Solomon's decision. But I don't want to discuss a court case. It's just a proof that God is not an enemy of human wisdom or human knowledge. Solomon asked for the ability to discern between good and evil. And he got it. He was allowed to think and to make his own decisions. And I believe this is what God wants from us. To think, to use our brains 
and to make responsible decisions. Okay, but how in that case? How are we to understand the story of Adam and Eve? Why were they prevented from getting the knowledge or skill which could be very useful in their task of administrations of God's garden? And what then is the essence of the original sin? Why exactly were they excommunicated? Why their deed was a crime and not an act of a noble rebellion against a tyrant? Because it's maybe a surprise, but the words used in both stories, Adam's and, and Solomon's, the words are almost exactly the same. You will not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Contra, give your servant a heart able to discern between good and evil. It seems both wanted the same. So where is the difference? One was punished. The, the second was, was praised. Well, I think there are three main differences in the stories. First one, the nature of gaining the knowledge. For Solomon, the wisdom was God's gift, an answer to a petition, a prayer heard and wish fulfilled. Solomon asked God and he got the gift. While Eve and Adam acted like thieves, stealing the fruit, eating it with bad conscience and hiding afterwards. Not a good start of knowledge or with wisdom. Second difference is the motivation of the act or request. Eve and Adam are tempted by the desire of universal knowledge, maybe the desire of improved status. The serpent said, you will be like God. That was what they wanted. They had no plan what they wanted to, to do with the new knowledge. They just covered something they cannot have, the divinity. Solomon's request is motivated by desire of justice and fair judgment. It's driven by a responsibility and also awareness of personal insufficiency. He doesn't want the wisdom for its own sake or to show off. He needs it as a tool for fulfilling God's God-given mission. He wants it to serve others and to serve God's justice. Well, this is what wisdom is for. Real wisdom should work for improving the world, should help to promote truth and justice and mercy. Knowledge should be used to help people to make their life, lives better, to solve problems and to heal relationships. Knowledge must have a moral aspect. Without it, it's a way to hell, away from paradise. There is many examples in the history how knowledge without moral imperative is destructive. Just see how many great scientific inventions 
originally intended to tackle specific problems, how many of them were turned into terrible weapons? Or look how such ingenious structure like the internet is being misused for bullying, for threatening people, or as a means of crime. And I think this is the third difference between the stories of Adam and Solomon. The outcome, the result. When Solomon got his wisdom, he immediately used it to help promoting justice. He employed it to find the truth where it seemed impossible. He governed the people entrusted to him. He governed them with the wisdom. He served others with the talent he got. He was building the fellowship of the people. On the other hand, the only knowledge which Adam obtained seemed to be the awareness of nakedness and shame. He was thinking only about himself, selfishly and self-centeredly. He was not able to admit and confess his sin, and it immediately destroyed the relationships, the feel of community, the trust between husband and wife. They are blaming one another. Adam and Eve's decision brought only destruction and loss to all. Their deed hurt. While Solomon's wisdom helped to rectify society and improve people's lives. And so here, I believe, we got to the core of the message. God is not against using our brains. God is not against sapiens. On the contrary, he is the supreme source of all wisdom, giving it to all who long for it and who ask for it. But he is strictly against knowledge without moral guidance. Selfish cleverness focused only on personal profit, disregarding others. So let us pray as Solomon prayed to God of all knowledge for, for his wisdom and for his spirit, which can teach us to use the wisdom to search for the truth, to help others, to build the just society according to the will of Jesus the righteous. Let us use our brains as much as possible to discern between good and evil and to uphold the good and to uproot the evil from our world. And may the Lord hear our prayers and give us what he gave to Solomon. Amen. And let us put this prayer inside or into our singing. We will sing the hymn, Give Me Oil in My Lamp. You can find it in the Mission Praise Hymn Book number 167.
seeking Keep me seeking till the break of day Before we pray the prayers of intercessions for the needy, poor and troubled, I as usually want to remind us all that a prayer is not just words, but those who pray must be prepared also to take responsibility and actively do everything they are able to fulfill their request. So let us think of ways how to support the needy we are praying for, how to support the abandoned, the forgotten, the poor, the ill, the sad, helpless and hopeless. Let us use our possessions for service of love, mercy and truth. And let us not forget our responsibility for, for the church fellowship. Although we can't support the congregation with our presence, we can do it by donation. If you want to contribute to Lockerbie, Drivesdale, Hutton and Cory Church of Scotland, please follow the link on the screen and contact Kate, the treasurer, and find how it's possible to do it. But now let us pray the prayer of intercession. Dear God, we thank you for creating us as thinking beings. Thank you for the ideas and inspirations that we find in your word. Lord, help us to live according to the truth. Help us to lift up our eyes from ourselves to things that really matter love and mercy we bring to you all the people surrounding us lord touch them with your kind healing hand
Show them your love and your mercy and fill their lives with peace and joy. We pray for all suffering, for all hungry and thirsty. Lord, release them from suffering. Feed the hungry and give water to the thirsty. And let us and all your church be prepared to serve those in need with all our strength, our will, our talents and our possessions. We pray for all ill, especially for those who contracted the COVID-19 virus and who are in the immediate danger of death. Lord, heal them. And, and Lord, if it's time for them to go to you, Lord, be their companion on the road. Bring them safely into your kingdom of love and peace. Lord, we also pray for little Tanya and her family. We pray that you hold them in, in your hand, that you lead them through suffering to better knowledge of yourself and your truth. Lord, heal their bodies and souls. Fill them with your spirit of hope. Lord, use the hands and brains, knowledge and skills of doctors, nurses and all support staff to bring healing and salvation. Lord, we also pray for your church, that we never are locked into our own world, but share your goodness with others. Let your name is preached and praised all over the world. And let your love changes our lives and the whole society. And we call to you together with all your children. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. And let us go on with God's blessing. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And we'll end with the hymn, Glory, glory in the highest, number 174 in the Mission Praise Hymn Book. God bless you.